Hi everyone, welcome back. In this particular video, we're going to look at some examples of retrosynthesis. Uh, so these are examples where we are trying to solve a synthesis problem, okay? And the problem we have here is to convert the starting material into that product. So this is the given starting material. And here's our product or target that we want to make, okay? That's what we're trying to get to, okay? Now, in approaching problems like these, the very first thing that you want to ask yourselves is, is there a change in the number of carbons or is there a change in the carbon skeleton? Now, to help with this process, I'm going to just number the carbons. So if I number my uh, starting material, it looks like I have one, two, three, four, and five carbons in my starting material. My product, on the other hand, has one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven carbons. So clearly, it looks like I have to add two carbons to solve this problem. And then the second thing that you look for is a difference in functional group, if functional groups have changed. And again, this particular problem, notice how our starting material is an alkene, whereas my product, the final product, is an alkyne. Okay, and I would also like to note that my final product is a terminal alkyne. Okay, it's a terminal alkyne. It's an alkyne at the end of a carbon chain. And that's important because sometimes that could tell us uh, or give us some clues or hints about how to approach this problem. Okay, so now we have to add two carbons and my product is a terminal alkyne. So if I look at this, looks like the first, the five carbons here are sort of preserved in the product. Uh, the difference is there was an alkene or a double bond between uh, three and four, and that is gone now. There's not there in the product. And uh, on carbon five, I have an alkyne or a two, uh, an acetylene group connected to it. Okay, there's a two carbons. There are two carbons with a triple bond. How do I make something like that? If I had to make uh, a connection like this, how would I do it if I wanted to make this bond? Is the question that I wanna ask myself now. Okay, uh, and it seems like uh, this is a terminal alkyne overall. It's connected to a carbon here, number labeled as five. So I could do an alkylation of the alkyne, or I could use an acetylide ion as a nucleophile to attack an alkyl halide, because if this is where I want to disconnect, or if this is where I want to make the bond going forward, okay, disconnect going backward, or connect going forward, then, I could get that product if I had something like this, an X, okay, which is a good leaving group. And I'm still preserving my one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, and there's the X. So there is a leaving group connected to carbon labeled as five. Okay. Plus, if this alkyne or the triple bond came in as a nucleophile. So I could use sodium acetylide, just the simplest alkyne possible. Because if we have this nucleophile and this is a primary alkyl halide and this X, you could put a Br here, you could put a chlorine or you could put an iodine doesn't matter, a any of those would be fine. But uh, again, I would say in synthesis problems, it is always best 
to go with a bromine, okay? Because there are more uh, uh, reactions or those more manipulations that you can achieve uh, with a bromine. And I'll, and I'll talk about some of those during the synthesis. So I, I'm going to choose bromine here, but it could be a, a halide at this point, but I'm going to go specifically with the bromine. So if I have this alkyl bromide, okay, uh, if I change it to a bromine now here, this nucleophile can go and attack that carbon and the bromine would get kicked out so going forward, it will give me the product that's up there. And for doing this reaction, this is a SN2 reaction. So we need some polar aprotic solvent. And for sodium acetylide, a good solvent that's typically used is THF. So I could put THF over there, okay? So I have a nucleophile, I have an alkyl halide, and there's a solvent. And primary alkyl halide, so we do the reaction. So now, so we've come back or we've, we've worked backwards right now, sorry. We work backwards and we have this alkyl halide. Now, the next thing that I wanna ask myself is, okay, how do I convert this alkene, which is my starting material into that alkyl halide? Because if I look at it, that alkyl halide has a halogen on carbon number five here. Uh, but for this particular alkene, uh, the double bond is between carbons three and four. So to get this alkyl halide, we might have to like put the double bond between four and five, because if I have an alkene where the double bond is between carbons four and five, I'll be able to make that alkyl halide. This should be possible because this is an alkene. That's an alkyl halide where I'm adding the halogen on the less substituted carbon, okay? So doing a hydrohalogenation here, but less substituted. So that means we're talking about the anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation. So if I use HBr along with some peroxide, that's going to give me the less substituted alkyl halide. And this is why I said uh, I would like to use the Br because the anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation works only for HBr. It doesn't work for HCl, okay, or other alkyl halides. So HBr is the best one here. So now we have an alkene, okay? And now if you look at it, what we have to do is to go from the starting material to this new intermediate that we have. We have to switch the double bond from this, from between three and four to between four and five. Now, how is that possible? Is there a common intermediate here that would help me switch between, uh, switch the double bond from three and four to four and five? Uh, what would be a precursor to make this alkene? if we had an alkyl halide like that, I could make that alkene from this alkyl halide. And again, I'm going to use Br uh, just to stay with the theme. And like I said, with synthesis, Brs work best, the bromine uh, always work best. Okay, so if I have this alkyl halide, I can make that alkene using an E2 reaction, okay? But from this alkyl halide, I want the less substituted alkene. Uh, okay, the less substituted alkene is what we want. Uh, again, the numbering is one, two, three, four, and five. So I'm going to use a bulky base here. So if I use potassium T butoxide here, which is a bulky base, that's going to give me a Hoffman elimination, which is the less substituted alkene from the alkyl halide. Okay, and now we are at an alkyl halide, our precursor is an alkene. And notice how in this particular alkyl halide, the bromine is connected to carbon four, which is actually involved in the double bond uh, here in the starting material. And carbon four is the less substituted carbon. So that means if I take that alkene, which is the starting material, and if I add 
HBr to it or do a hydrohalogenation on it, but anti-Markovnikov again, that would convert my starting alkene into the less substituted alkyl halide. The less substituted alkyl halide can then be converted into the less substituted alkene, right? This is the, uh, starting from there, this is the less substituted alkyl halide. Okay, that's why we did the peroxide effect. Then moving forward from here, okay, this is an E2. This is the less substituted alkene. Okay, and then we are going to another less substituted alkyl halide. This is also a less substituted alkyl halide here. Okay, and finally we do an SN2. This is a biomolecular substitution reaction, SN2 reaction, and we can convert our starting material into the product. Okay, so I hope uh, this example helps. It walks you through uh, uh, some of the strategies that we could be used and what the thought process is here. And as you would notice, I sort of work backwards completely through this, okay? So this would be an example of a retrosynthesis, how you could achieve or approach a synthesis problem working backwards. Now, uh, it may not work always. Sometimes you might have to work backwards and then go forward a little bit. Okay, and, and we'll look at some other examples uh, along that line.